one thing for sure that a lot of you know about already is like how the society uh, treats people with uh, disabilities and how, how the attitudes around you us. Well, I've discovered over the years that I, I, I don't need to, I don't really need to sit down and tell you or anybody else about weakness. Uh, I want to talk to you about strength. And I want to talk to you about what people can really do when they're motivated and when they're clear about who they are. Um, I think that I got polio when I was 14 in, in uh, 1953. So that's a while ago. But it was before the vaccine. So, uh, and I don't know how many of you can remember those days, but uh, polio was a scourge. You know, it was a terrifier. People were, were just terrified that their children might get it, uh, or, or their families or somebody might get it. It was a virus spread like a flu or cold. And, uh, not too many people died around me, but some of my, one of my friends died, and then I got it. Uh, and when I got it, everybody got it. My whole family got polio. Uh, but their polio was non-paralytic. They, they, uh, all, they all they had was basically they, they were uh, quarantined. Now, people were so afraid of polio, though, they, they, when somebody would get polio in your household, they would uh, put these big red signs on the front of your house and, uh, and warn everybody away. And people had to stay in. You know, when I when I got polio, the whole school went to. It was such, it was such a big uh, attitude about what might happen. And I was a uh, first. I was a bunch of guys poster child, but then they discovered that I was too disabled, right? And the bunch of guys was a classic for charity, and that they uh, they. They knew how to make people feel terrifically guilty if they yeah, They knew how to pull all kinds of money out of people. Yeah. But in the process of doing that, they created a lot of fear and a lot of, a lot of problems for all of us, as most charities have. Because they have this dual role, they're supposed to be helping you uh, or a family, but at the same time, they've got to get money. So they portray you as weak and sick and unable, and actually have probably created a lot of the old attitudinal problems that we fight day to day now. Uh, so when I talk uh, to people, I talk about the fact that we have the group of groups of people who are out there in charity. We can all have that to things that that to people who have some civil rights. You know. As weak as they are, as, as intact as they are, they still are basic rights. And we do have a right now, uh, if we are discriminated against, to, uh, people, to fight that. And discrimination comes in a lot of forms. So when I uh, came for a group and I talk, I, I talk about my experiences. I talk a lot about the fact that I've become a very strong person over these years. Not only, not only from the life in general, but because I had a disability. It forced, it forced me to do things and learn things that many uh, young people never have to. I haven't come to terms with death. I'm not afraid of that. I had to when I was 14 and 15. First thing I had to decide was when I wanted to live or die, um, which is a very difficult decision. I wanted to die. So when you're 14 and you're paralyzed from the neck down and you're in and out of love, um, you have to be terrifically creative to uh, commit suicide. I read the movie. And there are all these people around you, doctors and nurses and everybody that. Or, you know, their job is to save your life and get it that you've been totally depressed and not knowing what the hell your life's going to be all about. And I, I had totally accepted the whole idea that being crippled was terrible. It was the job. We don't, we don't really understand how we, uh, how we inculcate all these attitudes in people. But how in fact that, that before I even became disabled, um, I saw it as really being a terrible thing, tragedy, and how awful it would be to be disabled. I can remember sitting on my father's shoulders, and um, I was at like state fair or something, and I saw this young woman in a wheelchair, who obviously had several palsy, who, you know, 
moving about, but she was just moving around looking at me. And I was fascinated by this person. I've never seen anybody like that. And I was really looking, and all of a sudden my father reached up to me, get me back, he said, don't stare. Without any explanation. But I thought, well, oh my God, if you can't even look at it, what does that be? Something real to be to be a parade out of it. And terrible. And you know, in so many ways, we, we uh, perpetuate with our young people these stereotypes. I mean, we often not explain what we might not be polite to share. But she was fascinating. She was different, you know. Uh, and I, I celebrate difference. I think difference is, is wonderful. And it would be pretty awful if we were all the same. Um, and I've learned about my difference. Uh, but when people stare at me, when they look at me, or they uh, see me as, as so different that maybe in a way they come out and have a lot of pity and feel sorry for me. I have a couple of reactions. One is that uh, um, I can probably get anything I want out of them because I can manipulate the hell out of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, they see me as weak and unable, but well, I'm not. And, uh, and I, I come on strong and capable as well. Well, they are staring at my wheelchair, my respirator, and just feeling terribly sorry for me. I can, I can use that. <laughs> it's a very powerful tool, and it's something we should teach people to use practically. The other feeling I have is that uh, it's, it's totally their problem, <laughs> and I'm not going to I'm not going to internalize that and feel bad about who I am because they come on like that. Uh, I don't think they like it, but I also do, and I learned this uh, interestingly enough from the women's movement. I learned. Uh, how to manipulate a stereotype, right? Uh, I was in a couple of self-support groups of women at early in Berkeley. I was watching these women teaching each other how to manipulate you again. The stereotypes of weakness in women to us as well. And the femininity and all the things that I was thinking, boy, that would work real well for disability. And I began to use it uh, practically. Now, you see a lot of people that do that as a part of their whole life. And it's a different thing, I think. And that's all they know how to do when they come from a side of weakness to do that to manipulate. I don't understand most of your parents. And do, they, do they see that a lot, your own children, as they manipulate you to try to get something? And you need to be aware of that. And they, may not, they may not be very aware of how they're doing it, but it's a very natural tendency to use that and uh, to play on you know, your, your feelings. You may have some guilt feelings. You may have a lot of other kind of feelings. But hopefully you can recognize how it happens and, and, uh, and encourage it when it, needs to, when it needs to be used, but also be clear with them that that's happening. Uh, and that they can come from that angle, but they can come from other points of view, too. And, and especially, my mother was probably the most important person in my life uh, because she would believe in me. She was told, I mean, she went to the doctor after I'd been uh, ill for about two days. And polio is a uh, uh, voracious fever. You're running 106 fever. So you're, you're really going through a lot of dreams and a lot of hallucinations and things. So you're terribly sick. They don't know whether you'll live or not. Antibiotics didn't really work to stop the fever. She went up to the doctor and said, that's what I live or die. And the doctor said, well, maybe you should hope she dies. Because if he lives, there'll be nothing more than vegetables for the rest of his life. Now, I don't know how many of you had that one to you, but I'm proud as hell to be here as an Irish uh, <laughs> And I use that real a lot because I think, I mean, first of all, that's such a dead serious thing that He's saying to a doctor, is my child going to live or die? And the doctor says it's better that he should die than live as a, a cripple for, and there'll be nothing more than a vegetable. Well, he doesn't know. I mean, I'm not sure why medical people and others around like to predict the dire, most dire circumstances of not who you are. But, and almost everything that I was told was bullshit. I mean, uh, and you need to be clear about that. I mean, that somehow people, people, 
relish or something in telling you the worst. You know, that your child or your friend, the person that you trust in will never be able to do this, will never have a family, will never. Uh, when I brought up the issue of sexuality, oh my God. I mean, I, I, I what I recognize now is that they must have been real screwed up themselves about their own sexuality. <laughs> because uh, obviously they couldn't talk about it to me. Uh, and, and I think that's true. You know, that's the only explanation I have. Um, and, and as I got in, I wanted to know. I wanted to know if I have a normal sex life or if I have children. All those questions, and they, every answer was negative. Every time I asked, or even though when I didn't ask, about what my future would be like, there was a negative reply. Maybe some people that are choose to go into those professions are so wound up and trying to help, uh, and um, in, a, in a sense, take over for you. Uh, and in a sense, are trying to prepare you for the work. I don't understand it. I don't, I don't understand the psychology of it. So, but it's pretty awful when you're a parent or, or a person with a disability to get to hear that only the most negative aspects. Not that a doctor will say to you, but, you know, this person that you're helping to raise uh, will depend, it's got a lot of what happens in terms of whether things are positive or negative depend on whether you are positive or negative and whether you can help the person learn to advocate for themselves. But first, you got to do it. When I went to graduate from high school, I was, I was uh, in high school by radio telephone. I didn't want to go out because I was terrified that people would stare at me. I didn't like myself very much. As I said, I accepted all those old stereotypes that I had. And uh, I did very well in school. I didn't have a lot of distractions either. I didn't, I, I didn't have all those meeting, social uh, rating and dating and all that, uh, all that stuff. And so I could concentrate on my studies. But I went from, I was studying. I mean, I didn't know I, I had a brain hardly. When I was in grammar school, I, I hated school. It was really, but for me, it was, it was torture. I liked the way I played sports. I was a young athlete. And I was an inspiring athlete. I was a good athlete. Uh, I wanted to be a professional baseball player. <coughs> well, polio changed that real fast. It made me begin to think of uh, another profession at least. Uh, and I began to discover that, that I had a brain, and that uh, not only did I have a brain, but that I was smart. Uh, and that when I applied myself, that I was one of the top students in the high school. Um, and so, it, what a change uh, from being viewed as a kid who was a kind of average, ordinary kid, not the brightest, to one of the top students in the class. Um, and I, I began to realize the advantages of being considered smart. Uh, and, and, you know, the way people label you in schools and the way you label yourself is so much similar to the way you're labeled when you become disabled. Uh, whether you're labeled severely disabled or whatever your label is, uh, CP or MS or oh man, there's so many labels I can't believe. So all of, all of them are negative. Uh, and then we move enough labels into, somebody called me an invalid the other day. Invalid? I love that word. It's just one of my real favorite. And then after a while I was a shut in. Uh, I have some deaf and dumb friends. Uh, and I mean, you think of the words that are used, pimple, the word pimple. Uh, all the words that are used to describe us in any way are the worst. I mean, they're, they're, they epitomize how we are viewed by society, how we are not valued in any sense of the word. We need, to, we need, all of us together need to be sure that we are using value, valued language. I, when I talk, I have a person with a disability. First, first, and then I have a disability. And when I talk, I talk about it. I, people have needs, but that's not our whole life. My disability does not define my whole life. I have just normal needs like anyone else, and wishes and desires, and to move people apart, segregate them, put them in separate schools, and kid them so 
separately. There's a real problem in my feeling. It, it, uh, it perpetuates the present on, on a lot of things. It, to me, that's just um, what we have to do together is be very political. I mean, that's what you're here for, obviously. I mean, you're so lucky. Uh, this is a remarkable thing that's happening here. Uh, I don't. I don't know too many states that would do this. Uh, have some leaders that have the imagination and the ability to bring people like you've heard today, and myself and others in to talk to you about it, to give you some of our experience, and maybe to teach you that some of what you've heard and some of the expectations you've heard for your children and yourself are not true and don't have to be true. And, uh, that a few people can make a big difference in the state or the country. And make fundamental change. And we need to change this place. I mean, I began to discover how little, uh, how, well, everybody else is concentrating on disability, how sometimes disability was irrelevant almost. It didn't matter as much. It's funny, I, I went to the University of California in Berkeley, and I was a bitch to get in. I mean, it was amazing. So you find, well, we tried couples and they said, oh, I love it. And then when I got in, there was a headline in the local newspaper, it's a helpless triple with 10 cows. Great, I still have that. I, I saved those. You know, you can, they're, they're priceless. Uh, so it's got to be able to laugh now. It's really got to be able to laugh at these things because that they come from compassionate ignorance. You don't see it quite as much anymore, but people. People still do make those kind of uh, thought thoughts. I, uh, after I was at Berkeley here, I fell in love with people have. You know, we do that once in a while, and it was wonderful. What a great feeling. Um, and um, it became, I was told that I could never drive a power wheelchair. That I was just too disabled to drive a power wheelchair. And it's, it's ridiculously inconvenient to say, an attendant with you, pushing you around in a wheelchair everywhere. Right? Real difficult to be intimate and, and to be alone with this lady. And, um, and I learned how to drive a power chair in two days. <laughs> <laughs> two days, this lady was on my lap, and we were heading off to the sunset. I tell you. Um, and what is, that's motivation, you know? And was your, was your highly motivated to do something, I got support of them. I'm a rehab engineer, and we figured this thing out so fast. <coughs> and yet, for 15 years, I was pushed around. It, uh, it changed my life again. I mean, it was like leaving, leaving home for the first time, going to, uh, going to uh, the university, and going, hiring my own lieutenant, and then firing one for the first time. And learning, <laughs> learning that I could control my own life. And that was, you know, Talk about being reborn and revitalized. So the tower chair was almost exactly the same kind of thing. For those of you that have children or, or people that are not mobile, find a way to get link to mobile because it fundamentally changes the personality. I don't know. Little babies, children a year old or two years, who have never been mobile because they're paralyzed or for what is and all of a sudden they get an electric scooter. Something. And within 10 minutes, their personality has changed from being totally passive to being so aggressive, you wonder where they're going to go next. I mean, <laughs> how they're they going to challenge. We took a, a young student at Berkeley who came in and he, all he'd done for 15 years was in his room. Yeah. This guy was a genius. He was a bright, black time guy who had done all this assembly work and built all these stuff. And we brought him to Berkeley with the heart of him. But he would talk, he had to get real close because it was so young. He just wasn't used to talking to people at all. And uh, we gave him a power chair the first day he got there. And we lost him. We couldn't find him. He was, finally, the campus police brought him back. And uh, they, they fished him out of the creek. Uh, because what he was doing, he was going to the, and Berkeley had a lot of hills. And he was on the top of the highest hills, and he was putting his wheelchair on full speed. And he just went as fast as he could. He couldn't stop, and he ran in the creek. 
Um, and he was, that day, he came in and I heard him talk. I mean, he was so totally exhilarated by the ability to be able to move and to do things. And I think that's where Primo uh, takes engineering and, and the use of, of uh, new technology comes in. I'm just learning how to use a computer, for example. Wow, what a big change that's going to be in my life. And I, I've, always, I've always dictated. I went through reading thousands of uh, books at the university because I, I, uh, I worked through a PhD in political science, of course, politics, right? Uh, and I read thousands of books with about stick. Well, if I had a kind of computer, I could have written so much faster, so much uh, easier with word processing than I, than I had at that time. And it's hard for me to write, but with a computer, I think I'm going to be able to find it. I talk a lot, but I'm going to be able to finally write it down. It's like I'm better because everybody else is writing what, I, what I've been talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with my, with my mother, uh, we had to learn to fight together because there were so many people around with their little narrow rule books and who uh, were always willing to say no. I mean, it, it was so amazing to me. I know. Those of you that were ready at the table, parent, you must run into that a lot. You know, you go to school and you want your, your, your son or daughter to go to regular school or have this term or whatever. And people find a way of saying no. And sometimes when they're in a large bureaucracy, it seems like it's so cold. And, and it seems so difficult to be able to fight them. Uh, and one of my first struggles was uh, I went to graduate from high school. And I, I was immediately told that I couldn't graduate uh, because I didn't have driver training in PE. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, well, you know, it's, it's like, to say the least, that pisses me off. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was the number two student in school. And um, I finished, I'd done all the academic requirements. My mother, she, she said something like, well, goddamn it. Uh, we'll prop up behind the wheel and I'll, I'll run the wheel. You know, he got very sarcastic at this guy. And then the guy said, well, he looked right at me and had basically patronized me. He said, you wouldn't want to cheat the club, would you? Oh, no, that's really cold stuff. And it's, it's, uh, and aside from being almost humiliated, working so hard and feeling that I earned it, and at the same time, feeling like I wanted to kill a guy, you know, <laughs> whoop my mom and I. Um, and so what we did was, at that time, first we threw the guy out of the house, and he had to come to me. Uh, which is very interesting for all, but more of us could do that. Uh, and secondly, we began to say, hey, how can we make this, how can we change this decision? Uh, and uh, we went to the school board, and it was no problem, the school board. All we had to do was say, hey, look, this is injustice. And in every way, I earned my degree. And uh, what are you going to do about it? Uh, I got the first to follow all the students. But it was a very important thing for me and my mother to fight together. It was like a landmark for me, first of all. In fact, I don't think I could have done that alone at all. And, I, and both of us were terrified. I mean, boy, were we afraid. Uh, not that we'd lose, but it's scary going up against the door. It is. It takes a lot to be able to do that. And, uh, and it was no, there was no question once they heard it. It, it, uh, it was given by the plumber. Well, you know, what that did for me, along with small, other small fights that we had, that we both learned how to fight together, was it gave me the confidence to fight for myself. And I think that's why I'm here right now, in a lot of ways. Because I learned how to fight. I learned, I learned that if I was going to be free, if I was going to be independent, if I was going to lead my own life, that I had to fight for it. And if the other thing I learned is that when you start fighting, it encourages a lot of others to do it too. It's like role modeling. And one, when we set up the Center for Independent Living, the first really Center that brought together a lot of people with severe disabilities got to live together, but to fight and advocate together. We found how powerful, serious, 
peer relationships, peer counseling. Yeah. Um, I would to the uh, person, I'll tell you one more. See, I was so terrified when I was young, I stayed in five years. And nobody should really say that this may happen overnight. It's a process everyone goes through from often feeling basically weak and unable and not very powerful to basically learning how to love yourself again. When you begin to learn how to love yourself, you find out that others love you as well. And you begin to get into frequency relationships. Uh, and friendships and all, all kinds of things. I stayed in five years. I was terrified. If I went out, people would stare at me. Uh, and so my mother and uh, a couple of us said, and I did, if you don't go out, you're going to be here your whole life. And my biggest fear was what would happen when my parents died. And of course, their fear, biggest fear was, will we be taking care of this? Our son, our whole life. Um, and so with the swift kick of the black, I believe in those, by the way. I think sometimes we're too gentle and we don't teach people uh, to take risks. You want to learn how to take risks. When they're young or old, and that's the only way that we learn together, is learning how to take that next step or that next risk. Uh, I decided I'd physically attend the high school one day. And they got me in the car, drove me to this courtyard where about 200 students were. And I went, oh no, you know, that feeling again. And they started getting me out, everyone turned to their eyes. I mean, here it was, my worst pair was, <laughs> I was sitting in the middle of it. And uh, all of a sudden, something happened to me. I looked around, and I wasn't hurting. It didn't hurt. And I said, oh. Oh, it's kind of like being a star. <laughs> oh, hey, that's not so bad. You know, and then I I also said, not only does it not hurt, and maybe it's not so bad to be stared at. Uh, and then I said to myself, hmm, you know, I have a choice here. I can decide that it's because I'm ugly and because of all of the bad feelings I have about myself. Or I can decide, I'm a star, I'm just different. And that was very important to me because I began to make choices about how I accepted it. And I realized, hey, I'm going to separate here what's my problem from what's somebody else's problem. And the fact that they're all staring at me doesn't have to be my problem. It could be theirs. Um, uh, and at the same I think those things were very important to me. I, and I try to teach those. That you make choices on how you feel, when people, when people stare at you or not, and that can be taught. You know, I, I think there's a lot of lessons I've learned being a person with a disability. I've been disabled now 34 years, uh, and I, I think it's been essentially a positive experience and a, a strengthening experience, and I think it can be for those people. Uh, and a lot depends on your attitude. You have a positive attitude, you have a character, you have a person. And then you move through life that you're all trying to You take risk, you learn to take risk, and you have courage to take risk in your life. So you, you uh, come up against new situations, the toughest, one of the toughest. Because I had to learn to say, well, I love you. Because I was afraid that when I said it, I'd get hurt too bad. I do not feel that. But what I did, the rewards were very great. As they often are. And life's great. And life, I have a little bit different perspective. You know, I, I relate to children real well because I'm at their level. It's <laughs> <laughs> interesting. It really is. I mean, once you see it, most children are very direct and honest. You know, they're more what happened? Why? Can you, can you tell them that this? That's fine. And I think my nine-year-old, he's nine now, he's a lot of he probably taught me as much as anybody has taught me because with your daddy or mama, it doesn't matter if you're home, whether you're in a wheelchair or what, what you are or you know, I wish more people could come to that perspective. You know, uh, whatever it is that about you that makes you different is pretty irrelevant. <laughs> it's 
who you are as a person. It's the most relevant thing of all.